trying to um, mimic insect respiratory biomechanics and some of the uh, work that's come out of that. So uh, why are we studying insects? Um, insects, as you all know, your biophysicists have a really completely different um, way of delivering oxygen to the cells. Um, they don't use blood as an intermediate carrier. Um, because of this unique respiratory system, they have the highest metabolic range in the animal kingdom. Um, and that's attributed to their unique um, respiratory system. The other reason that we're studying insects from the point of view of bioinspiration for microfluidics is if you want to look at a system in nature where, you know, that has evolved to handle fluids at the micro scale, insects are a wonderful example. Um, you know, they ha handle air in their respiratory systems, um, liquids in their hemolymph, the insect substitute for blood. Uh, they Many of them fly, you know, bees handle nectar, et cetera. So we think we have a lot that we can learn um, from insects. Um, as I mentioned, the pathway for oxygen in insects is different from all of the other, you know, higher animals, higher organisms, multicellular. Um, they don't use blood as an intermediate carrier. Instead of having a single entrance to the respiratory system, they have pairs of spiracles around the body um, on the abdomen and thorax. And these spiracles um, can be opened or closed. They can control them. Um, and air goes in through the spiracles. It um, branches down the respiratory network, which has thousands and thousands of tracheal tubes, and goes directly to the tissues. And it's a tidal system. So um, oxygen depleted air comes out through the same pathway, but in reverse. You can see in this picture, and also if I go back to this movie, um, one thing I'd like you to notice is the abdominal pumping um, that you see here in the bees, and also in this depiction of insect breathing. So you see the volume of the abdomen changing, and that is important to our modeling. Okay, so here is a real spherical on the left. Can everyone see my, if I hold my cursor on the screen, are people able to, yeah, okay, yep. thank you. Um, so here is um, a, a um, caterpillar and you can see a spherical. On the left, we've got just a sort of cartoon uh, schematic of how the respiratory trachea branch from the spiracle down several branching generations directly to the tissues. On the right, we've got a dissected caterpillar, and you can see those white strings that kind of look like, uh, you know, what you see in egg drop soup or something, that those are the trachea. So it's in, extremely complex. And then here we've got on the left, a spiracle. Um, this is from my colleague, Jake Soha, a video from his lab. Um, this is a vivisected um, Zophobus morio. So this is one of our model animals that we use. And you see the beetle at the top. Um, this is the view we're looking at. So imagine now the exoskeleton is uh, cut away and we're looking at a vivisected um, view of just the hemolymph. And we can see that the some of these trachea as well you can see that there are really large scale trachea running across and you can see many many smaller ones um, and that clear tube in the middle is the insect heart so insects have a single tube for a heart it runs along the length of the body uh, kind of where our spine is located and when the heart beats, it's muscularized on the sides laterally in a lot of insects. And when it beats, it sends um, a peristaltic wave down the length of the heart. Um, and just one more mention on this slide. If you look at the upper right, this is a tiny, tiny fraction, a segment of a CT scan of the tracheal system of this beetle, also from the Soha lab. And you can see the incredible complexity um, of the tracheal system. He, these are some SEM images. Um, on the top left, we have the very smallest trachea um, penetrating the tissues. Um, those smallest trachea are called tracheoles, and they have a very thin wall compared to the rest of the system. Um, 
on the bottom left, we have a view of a spiracle and you can see it's got sort of these bristles to keep, you know, function kind of like eyelashes to keep debris out of uh, the respiratory system. On the bottom and top right, you can see some very close up images of insect trachea. And what you notice is that they are lined with these rings um, where the, um, the wall of the trachea is thickened and those are called tenidia. And those feature in our work uh, quite a bit. Um, if you now cut through the tracheal wall, you make an axial cut and you expose the side of these tenidia, you can see the cross section is sort of elliptical um, and they're covered with, with a layer. So there's lots of interesting microstructure on the inner surface um, of insect trachea. Um, for a long time, people thought that insects breathe by diffusion alone, but this is a nice little gif it shows you that really that can't be the story, right? Because if it were diffusion alone, um, even though insects are size limited now because of their unique respiratory system, if it were diffusion alone, they'd be, you know, they'd be limited to even smaller sizes, right? So here we have a very short model trachea and a very tiny insect and, um, Diffusion works just fine to deliver oxygen to all the cells. Here we have a larger insect, larger average trachea. And on the bottom, we have a really large insect. Um, and diffusion, of course, can't meet the needs of all of the tissues. So it has to be uh, something else. There has to be, you know, if you think of insects when they're doing really metabolically demanding activities like flight, you know, diffusion is not going to be enough to supply the energy they need. So um, people have taken live insects um, and imaged them uh, using x-ray synchrotron imaging. So this is again, my collaborator from Soha Lab. And I'm gonna show you some videos on the next slides. And these are this view that we're looking at on the right. So it's a top view of the head and thorax. Um, head is oriented to the left and we're looking at the main trachea um, in the thorax here. Now, keep in mind the videos we saw in the beginning of abdominal compression, right? So what we see here is a periodic compression, contraction of the main trachea in the head and thorax. So there's actually two sets. There's a pair, and then there's a pair that lies right underneath it. And it's a really interesting collapse. It's not a uniform collapse. This is not peristaltic wave propagation, right? We don't see a wave traveling down the length of the trachea the way we did for the heart. This is something else. This is um, looks like a buckling phenomenon. So if you look at this region of the left trachea, you can see that um, when the trachea is collapsed, it looks like there's an almost rectangular, uh, you know, buckling of that tracheal wall. Um, and it looks like it's basically happening simultaneously everywhere. So our hypothesis is that uh, when the insect contracts its abdomen, that pressurizes the hemolymph, the insect blood, which is not contained in vessels, but it's just sort of sitting in the body cavity, pressurizes the hemolymph and causes the tracheal tubes to fail locally in this buckling um, type of fashion. However, insects are very um, diverse. Um, they have lots of different ways. They're very robust. They, they develop lots of different ways to do things. Um, they tend to have distributed control systems. And so you can find, uh, that was a beetle on the previous slide, you can find insects. This is one insect in which we found uh, collapse in those same main trachea in the head and thorax, but this collapse looks peristaltic. Right, so here we see a clear traveling wave. Um, so <laughs> it's safest to say that, you know, that there's no one way, um, that insects collapse 
their larger trachea, um, some insects, you know, some insects are small enough that they don't need to do this, but many, many insects um, have active uh, respiration and they drive convective flows in their tracheal systems by collapsing portions um, of them in the larger tubes. So um, my group has done a lot of modeling of this phenomenon. Um, the simplest possible model that we've come up with is a single tracheal tube. And we've looked at um, what happens if we have these discrete collapses, as we see in most um, insects who have that type of tracheal collapse. Um, and we've tried to figure out or to quantify a little bit, you know, what do we need? Um, to create a flow. And it turns out we need two co we need to break the symmetry in some way, right? So we either need two collapses with a phase lag, um, or if we have just one collapse, then it has to be a propagating collapse. So I'll just go through um, some of our results, uh, not in too much detail, but um, the first modeling effort was really trying to model the kinematics of the, the most common type of collapse. So really taking this buckling phenomenon where you have these discrete collapse sites um, and making a model of that. Um, this is a, you know, Navier-Stokes um, Stokes flow approach where we model the wall, um, the shape of the wall. So the, the walls are H and we impose um, a wall collapse that copies the kinematics of the insect. And we can come up with wall shear stress, uh, volumetric flow rate, et cetera. Um, if we have two collapse sites like we see here and the collapse happens according to these two collapse functions in time, G1 and G2, um, the separation of those peaks can be represented as a phase lag theta. And I won't go too much into the mathematical details here, but we can look at streamlines um, and shear stress distributions on the right. Um, but what we see is that when that phase lag, if you look at the title of the slide, when that phase lag is zero, uh, there's no net flow, right? So we have flow um, moving symmetrically away from the collapse sites, but it's completely uh, symmetrical on the left and right, and there's no net flow. As soon as we break that symmetry and introduce um, a finite phase lag of 30 degrees, now we have streamlines crossing the symmetry plane and going to the right or to the left, depending on what part of the cycle we're in, and we have a net flow produced. And we showed that um, we can, there's an optimal phase lag um, depending on, so here we've got our volumetric flow rate in that single trachea model, um, and here's the phase lag. And depending on the total collapse, so if the um, tracheal tube collapse is just 40%, 50, 60, 70%, the optimal phase lag to produce the most flow is a little bit different. Um, we've done, you know, we've modeled a single trachea in many different ways. We've done mesh-free computations. Um, we've looked at things like um, if the if the cross section of the trachea remains circular during collapse, or if it becomes elliptical during the collapse. Um, we've looked at non-axisymmetric collapses. Um, we've also tried to optimize. Um, okay, you know, we're sticking with this simple model. We have a single tracheal tube model. Um, what is the optimal shape and distribution of two collapse sites that maximizes the flow? And um, if you look here at the flow rate versus the phase lag, this bottom curve is the non-optimized, you know, um, very simple identical collapse sites um, with the same shape. And we get, you know, about 0 0.04 non-dimensional units. Um, and we can get many multiples of that if we optimize the shape. And it turns out that the optimal shape is this, I wish I could zoom in there. I don't think I have a zoomed in view of this. So my apologies, right? But this, um, two, the, these are cross sections of our tubes looking from the side, fully collapsed. This top one corresponds to the non-optimized collapse site shape and we get very low flows. But if we make one 
collapse site long and one short. That's the optimum that we found. And we can get many multiples um, of the flow rate produced by this top um, geometry. And what we found is that optimized um, asymmetry in collapses is what we see in a lot of the portions of the tracheal tube tubes. Um, we've done mesh-free, you know, three-dimensional channels. Um, we were never really able to resolve the difference between the 2D simulations um, and the 3D. They give, you know, fairly different um, results for predicting the optimal phase lag, um, which is something kind of interesting. Um, I think I want to move on and talk a little bit about our modeling work for looking at tracheal flows in a network. Um, so here again are these main thoracic trachea in one of the beetle models that we work with. And we're imagining, again, there are several discrete collapse sites. And so we've made a model, an idealized model of this on the right, um, where we have two collapses in these bottom segments, three collapse sites on either side of the middle segments, and then two collapses on these outer upper branches, and then one in the middle, just kind of mimicking what we see. Um, and the question is, is there a way that we can, without using valves, um, direct flow into one portion of the tracheal network? So on the top, um, we've got some tracers in our flow and this is time zero. We start here and it turns out that yes, there are um, combinations of collapse timings that we can use in a network that will drive the flow only into parts of the network. So for here, in this case, we see flow driven into those outer branches um, toward the front of the animal and no flow going into the middle branches. So that is um, encouraging. Uh, we did a little bit of modeling of um, slip flow in insect respiratory systems because um, the spiracles are typically about 500 microns in diameter, and those are the very largest. Um, they're continuous with the very largest tracheal tubes in the respiratory system. The very smallest tubes are about one to half a micron in diameter. Um, and mo just like in the uh, you know mammalian vasculature, where most of our blood vessels are, are really small in diameter, in the insect, most of the trachea are very uh, have a very small diameter. They're on the smaller size, um, and they lie within the slip flow regime. So we start to get um, appreciable Knudsen number um, and rarefaction effects. So the Knudsen number, um, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, is a ratio of the molecular mean free path of um, whatever your gas is. So in air, you know, you can look at the average of, you know, O2, nitrogen, CO2, et cetera. And it's about um, 68 nanometers per air, right? And that's about the size of one tracheal. So your Nudsen number becomes close to one in the smallest tracheal tube. So slip flow effects, hydrodynamic slip are really um, important in a lot of the tracheal system. So this is a, this figure is sort of a, a cartoon that shows if we imagine that the insect tracheal system was one continuous trachea from the spiracle all the way down to the tissues. So there's an interesting sort of overlap region in the very small, the very largest uh, trachea are the ones that tend to collapse. Once you get into the small trachea, um, you know, the, the smaller the radius, the more resistant it is to collapse for the same pressure difference, right? So the smallest trachea don't collapse. However, slip effects become uh, very important there. But then there's this interesting overlap regime where we have both slip and collapse um, that we have modeled. Um, I'll just talk about kind of our main result from that work. Um, and here we've got a very similar single trachea model with a 30 degree phase lag between two collapse sites. And we're looking at four different times in our collapse cycle, um, or pardon me, two different times in our collapse cycle for three different slip parameters. So when beta equals zero, there are no slip effects. We're just in the continuum regime. And then we have a little bit of slip at beta equals 0 0.01 and then significant slip effects at beta equals 0.1. Um, 
So the solid line is no slip. And what we see, interestingly, is if you think about the effects, the flow being driven both by a pressure gradient and having a shear driven flow. So really air in the trachea set in motion by the fact that the collapse um, occurs, right? That the wall is is uh, in contact with the air and it's pushing the air, it's moving the air. That's um, um, a shear driven flow. Um, in the shear driven flow region, I mean, it makes sense, right? But the presence of slip actually decreases the velocity that's produced in the air. But away from the collapse sites where the flow is pressure driven, then the presence of slip increases the velocity of the air. So that was our uh, main result from that work. We've done a little bit of work trying to model realistic um, pressures in the tracheal system. So this work by Wasserthal, um, where he inserts a probe um, into one of the larger trachea and measures the pressure profile over time for several respiration cycles. Um, and so we tried to, to mimic the, um, the trends that we see there. Um, and the second result that we get from looking at slip in these models um, is that if you include slip and um, collapse, so the shear-driven, collapse-driven flow with hydrodynamic slip, for all other things being the same, if you pump, um, if the insect pumps its abdomen and collapses at one frequency, you can have flow in one direction. But then for a different range of frequencies, we actually get a reversal of the flow direction in this model. Don't know if insects do that, right? But we can see here below about 20 uh, degrees phase lag and above about, uh, you know, depending on the slip parameter, 150 degrees phase lag, we've got reversed flow. Um, and then for those intermediate values, we have flow in the other direction. So of course we wanted to, um, it's very, one of the, the frustrations of working on the system as fascinating as it is, and, and, you know, as rich as it is, is that it's extremely hard to measure um, velocities in the tracheal system, right? You have a uh, very low density fluid, so it's hard to put tracers in it like we could if it were a liquid. Um, and very the, the fluid's moving at very low speeds. A Reynolds number is about 0.1. So um, we made microfluidic models um, of insect respiration, both single trachea and network. A lot of this, I'm sitting in a biomedical engineering department, a lot of this was inspired by thinking about biomedical um, end applications, right, and thinking about how we can um, improve lab on a chip technologies and make them more um, efficient. So um, we see a lot of microfluidic chips depicted in, you know, journal articles, etc. We often see like zoomed in views like this top middle view here. Um, and what we don't see is the zoomed out view where you see many, many, many uh, pressure connections um, connected to make the flow go through all these, you know, hundreds of microfluidic channels. In principle, um, you know, if you talk about like quake, uh, quakes work with um, microfluidic large scale integration where you have microfluidic devices with hundreds of interconnected channels, um, in principle, you need um, three overlying uh, microfluidic channels to actuate the flow. So these aqua channels, these are the actuation channels um, to control the direction and speed of the flow in one microfluidic channel that we have um, in green here. Um, and so, you know, we wanted to see, well, instead of individually controlling the flow in each of these channels, maybe we can be a little bit inspired by how insects are able to um, have one driving actuation input signal, which is their abdominal collapse, the frequency of abdominal collapse, and really have that distributed control where, um, where we have different mechanical properties in different parts of the respiratory system. And so, um, they can, you know, close off flow to one channel, et cetera. Or we we theorize, we hypothesize that we can. In our models, they can. It remains to be seen. Okay, so um, here is on the top left again that same picture um, from the Soha lab of the main 
thoracic trachea branches. And then here's one of our network models that was um, put together to mimic that. Now, if you recall, I showed you videos of both um, simultaneous buckling collapse, discrete collapse sites in insect trachea. And I also showed you a type of tracheal collapse where that's a propagating peristaltic leg collapse. So we wanted to mimic both of these features. Um, we started by making three layer microfluidic devices. So the green channel, so this is a side view of our device. The green channel on the bottom is our actual flow channel in which we're trying to produce a flow. The red channel on top is our actuation channel. And for us, this is mimicking the pressure in the insect hemolymphs, right? So the tracheal tubes are floating in hemolymph. They can they um, contract their abdomen, the pressure of the hemolymph goes up. You know, how do we mimic that um, on a chip? So what we did is we had overlying channels. Um, this is a schematic of one of our devices that um, that has discrete collapses, not a propagating collapse. So this one's got two discrete collapses. As you can see, one of the collapse sites is longer than the other. And we connect this actuation channel to a pressurized air source, and we feed in um, either a square wave or a sinusoid. Most of the time, it's a square wave. And then between the two channels, there's a thin uh, deformable PDMS membrane um, that deflects when the red channel, the actuation channel is pressurized. That deflection causes the sealing of the flow channel to collapse and mimics uh, what we see in insect trachea. Um, so we wanted to mimic features of both directional collapse where we have one collapse site um, and it propagates the collapse wave propagates in time and also um, that so on the left and then on the right also those discrete collapses that happen simultaneously so we started by just sort of combining these features in a bunch of single trachea models um, in many different ways just to see what would happen and so one of the things that we used if we wanted to um, get a time lag in the collapse, so, so let me just orient you a little bit. So the colored channels, these are now top views of single trachea microfluidic models. The colored channels are the flow channels. The gray channels are the overlying actuation channels. And you can see both the flow channels and the actuation channels have different shapes. Um, let me talk about actuation first. So top left device S1, we have two discrete collapses, but we actually wanted to combine um, both modes of collapse that we've observed. So we wanted to put a phase lag between the two discrete collapses. And so what we have between the two collapses is a serpentine channel that slows the air down. And we um, insert air only at one side. So air enters, propagates, um, and comes over here. Um, and there's a, that ends up having a time lag between the two collapses. Um, if we look at, go down that first column to device S2, now the actuation channel is just uniform, it's just rectangular. When we pressurize the actuation channel, that um, is just gonna result in a rectangular collapse. However, the underlying flow channel is tapered. And so as, we, as I mentioned before, where it has a smaller um, width, it's going to be more resistant to collapse for the same pressure difference. And so that is also going to cause, so this is going to cause a propagative collapse from left to right. So from wide to narrow. Um, if we go down to S3, here we've got a model that does simultaneous discrete collapse with one collapse site being longer than the other. So we put pressurized air either on this end or this end. It goes simultaneously to the two collapse sites. Then S4, device S4 on the bottom, um, it's the same actuation, but now in a tapered channel. So we do expect to get the longer collapse site um, collapsing a little bit before the shorter collapse site. Right, so many sort of different combinations of time lag, propagating collapse, et cetera, playing around with symmetry, asymmetry, um, you know, same size of the collapse sites, different sizes. Um, what we found, and here is a uh, just an example of device S5. Um, this is with water in both the flow channel and the actuation channel with food coloring, just so you can visualize. Um, but what you see is the underlying flow channels 
got purple dye and the actuation channel has green and you can see just that square wave um, actuation. When these regions, um, two regions turn green, that means that the um, flow channel ceiling is being um, compressed actually all the way to the channel floor. So that is a typical um, view of these devices, even though most of the time we have air <laughs> in the actuation channel. All right, so what we found was that almost every combination of trying to produce a collapse produced a flow. As long as we broke the symmetry in some way, it produced a flow. Um, and so here we have the flow rate. So you can compare this with Q in our models in microliters per minute versus frequency, right? So this now is actuation frequency, which you can um, you can uh, sort of make a relationship between that and the phase lag in our models. And so we see a really similar structure for almost every of these devices. We see that they start out with a low flow rate. They generally increase. And then for a lot of them, you know, this blue curve that has one of the maximum flow rates, uh, device S7, the curves are color coded, so they match the flow channel coloring. Um, there doesn't seem to be that much of an optimal frequency. It tends to give a pretty high flow rate for a broad range of frequencies. But then we see um, this green curve, this sort of army green curve device S10, that's a very peaked um, profile. So it does have a very narrow band of optimal um, actuation frequencies. But one device did something really interesting. Whoop. Um, so let me actually, before I talk about the interesting device, um, I just want to mention that the flow rate also varies with the actuation pressure, as you'd expect, and that tends to have the same trend. If you increase the pressure, it increases until a certain critical value, probably constrained by the geometry, um, and then it starts to decrease. But one of these designs, S4, did something really interesting. So if you remember from our modeling, we said, well, uh, our model predicts that we can get reversed flow. We can get flow reversal as a function of actuation frequency. And device S4 um, did exactly that. So it had positive flow for actuation frequencies under about four Hertz. Um, and then the flow direction reversed from about four, you know, for the rest of the frequency range. And then we can see that sort of optimal flow rate um, range as well. So the optimal free forcing frequency here is about 16 Hertz. Uh, so that was really encouraging. Um, let me, I, I want to stick cl close to the original promised time of 30 minutes. So I, I th don't think I'll go over our ComSol modeling here, but there is one more thing I want to show you before I wrap up. And that is how we then took that behavior of that single trachea model S4 and said, okay, let's put this uh, S4 device now into a network structure and see if we can do what our modeling predicts, which is direct flow into only one branch of the network without using any valves. So we put together four basic designs um, of these coupled networks, tracheal networks, um, one thing I really want to point out and emphasize is that, okay, we have six flow channels in black here, but the actuation signal now is a single signal, right? We don't have three separate actuators per each channel to control the direction and the um, magnitude of the flow rate in the channel like we would in an MLSI system. We have a single input for our pressurized air. And so um, we have the pressure and then it's geometric effects that cause, you know, delays. Um, it's asymmetries in the geometry and the materials that cause delays and any kind of coordination. Um, so whatever results we see from these network designs, there's a single actuation input, a single signal. And so looking at the first device, we did in fact see uh, this type of behavior, right? And so this is color coded again. So we have channels A and B. B is colored blue over here and A is colored um, green. And what we saw basically was that, um, and then we've got C, which is black. 
A and B had flows in different directions. That's great. You know, mass is conserved. The flow through channel C was very low magnitude, but the channel actually turned on at some point. So at a frequency about one hertz, below one hertz, that channel was off. There was no flow through the channel. After about one hertz, the channel turned on. Um, in device M2, we didn't see any such behavior. The flow through um, all of the channels was you know, positive according to the direction that we define for that channel. So mass is still conserved. Um, but then device um, M3 showed um, the behavior that we were hoping to see. So now we've got flow through channel A depicted in green through channel C depicted in black, and those are both positive flows. Um, but then for channel B, we again see the flow switching on at a frequency of about you know half a hertz, a little more than half a hertz. So I'll show you a movie of this. So this is that device M3. Um, it's left, right symmetric. So I've only put food coloring in half the device here, but the same thing is happening on the other side. So it's being actuated at 13 Hertz um, with a pressure of 13 PSI. And these are the two sort of top channels that we have. And what we see is that um, there is no, we've got a reservoir here with black food coloring for that inner channel. So this, the device midline is here. This is channel C, and then we've got channels A and B. This is that outer channel, and the reservoir of fluid for the outer channel is green. The fluid for the inner channel is black. We see a little bit of diffusion, but there's no pumping of black fluid from this inner channel out. Now we do the same test, 13 PSI, but we increase the frequency. And what we see is that for every cycle, every actuation cycle, there's a bolus of black dye coming out of the inner channel and going into the outer channel. So we have turned on that middle channel by increasing the frequency, um, whereas the flow through the other channels has not turned on or off. Um, so this is exciting. You know, we don't have um, a schematic yet where we can say, oh, I can design a network and I can, you know, use this frequency to turn this channel on. But, you know, the potential here is is um, is good. So we have the potential to replace sort of the three actuation channels per flow channel with a single not, you know, not only for flow channel, but for an entire networked device. Um, let me finish up by just talking a little bit about the insect inspired technologies. So one thing that we've done um, with these insect inspired devices is um, we've made a pump that is a um, intended to be a biomedical device, a medical device, an ambulatory infusion pump for the infusion of insulin or, you know, something similar. Um, if we think about an insulin pump, a typical insulin pump, even the really slim profile patch pumps um, have a pretty high vertical profile, about 20 millimeters, because they require um, a motor and batteries. Well, um, in our device, uh, which we just, by the way, got a provisional patent for, so I would have been able to take these black squares off and, and show you the device, um, but I, I forgot to do that, sorry. Um, but if in our device, the flow through the device is actually driven by the radial pulse on the wrist. So the patch pump sits here. Um, instead of having a motor and batteries to drive the flow, we have the pulsation of the radial pulse that drives the flow through the device. And because of that, the device has a vertical profile of less than five millimeters, right? And if you look at the literature on um, patients with diabetes, you know, one of the largest complaints for and reasons for noncompliance is embarrassment, inconvenience, um, you know, discomfort. So eventually, um, hopefully we can develop this for medical use and it can be used with microneedle arrays, which are much less painful than, than macrobore cannulas um, that are typically used. Another interesting thing is we took this device, so we have to make some changes. It changes from a three-layer device to a two-layer device. We took it and we tried it on the wrist and it, it um, produced flow rates from, you know, the radio pulse of a you know, healthy 20-year-old male college student. 
um, that were on par with the basal flow rates in a typical um, insulin pump. So we're really excited by that. Um, we've also thought a little bit about how lessons from insects, microfluidics can um, influence our work on hemodialysis, which also includes thousands of microscale tubes uh, through which liquids are conducted, now not gases, um, but there's a lot to be done there as well. Um, I think I'm going <laughs> to skip ahead, um, end there um, by thanking my group um, who and, and my collaborators who, of course, you know, none of this would be possible without and, of course, my funders. And um, that's what I've got for today. Thanks very much. All right. Well, thank you very much for the uh, very interesting talk, Annie. Uh, so uh, if you have any questions, please uh, put it in the chat. So currently I'm seeing one question in the chat asking about the typical Reynolds number, but I think you have answered that question in your talk, right? Yeah, they might. I saw a lot of people were coming in during the talk. They might've missed that. I, we think that the largest Reynolds numbers that we get in a typical insect respiratory system is about 0.1. So it's creeping flow. So that Stokes modeling is, is a pretty good model for what's happening. Uh, so uh, I, I think, you know, for the rest of the audience, you can just feel free to like, uh, you know, unmute yourself and ask questions to Annie. You don't necessarily have to put it in the chat box now. Uh, Ashoka, I saw you were, re oh, you, you were, you were, uh, clapping. Well, you were clapping. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so, uh, actually, I mean, I, I do have one question, uh, Annie. Uh, so, um, so, uh, I, I'm just trying to think, you know, if you're trying to design a medical device uh, to be used on, uh, human, uh, then, you know, of course you have to design it in a, in a sort of, you know, error-proof way. Like, mm -hmm. uh, so when you do these, it, it's a really cool idea that you're using these pulsations, uh, to, yeah. uh, you know, uh, 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 get get rid of the uh, necessity of like larger pumps and uh, batteries and all that stuff. Uh, but how, you know, what about the reliability of these devices and, you know, where the pitfalls could be? Yeah, no, that's a great question that, you know, you, you really like put your finger on the, <laughs> on the pulse of, of what our work has been developing. This is a medical device. So if you go back to all the plots I showed you of flow rate versus frequency, you see that there's a very strong dependence on frequency. That's very bad if you want to deliver insulin at a steady rate because um, during exercise or region or you know periods of elevated heart rate, um, patients with diabetes actually need less insulin. <laughs> so we can, we do not want an increase in insulin delivery with a, with an increase in heart rate. Um, but this is a Shuyu. Zhang, oh my goodness, he's not he's not here on the left, but um, this guy here in the back row, second from the left, uh, Xu Yu Zheng, he's about to graduate with his PhD and developing this as a medical device is, is been his thesis topic. And Xu Yu has actually been able to develop three versions of the device. One where there is two where there's a correlation between flow rate produced and heart rate. Uh, one where it's a positive correlation, one where it's a negative. He's also produced a version of the device of the device where there is no correlation with heart rate. And interestingly, if you look at the standards, um, FDA um, bases their standard for infusion pumps on an international standard, and th the allowance for variability is quite large, up to 15% variability in flow rate is acceptable in an insulin pump. Mm -hmm. um, so we've already gotten the variability um, under 15%, which we're pretty happy about. Um, I think I, I mentioned we just got a provisional patent on that device. Um, and, you know, now now we get to, to face reality. And when we go to the companies and say, you know, here's our device, would you like to, would you like to license it or something, you know, and, and kind of, you know, see what, what people have worked in the field for a long time, what they have to say about it. Um, but yeah, we, we do, we have addressed the flow rate variability. Um, yeah, yeah, that was actually one of the questions when I saw it. Yeah. Because I'm like, what if the frequency changes? Yeah. 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 So 
So actually, I have a, another question. Uh, this is more like a clarification. Maybe I just missed, uh, you know, mm -hmm. some part of the of the talk. So you tried these different designs, like S one to S ten. Mm -hmm. So, uh, am I understand correctly? You were trying these different designs to find one, uh, with a property that you want. And to what exactly is the property that you want? Um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say we were trying to find one necessarily with the property that we want. We, before um, we fabricated the devices, we were actually afraid that they would not produce a flow. Oh. And so we said, let's take the uh, kinematic collapse kinematics we see in these main tracheal trunks and we'll just try several different combinations of what, of the kinematics we observe and maybe one of them will produce a flow. <laughs> I see. Right? Turns out they all produced a flow, like as long as the symmetry was broken in any way. But then we got um, very lucky and we found one, we happened upon a device design where the flow direction reversed with actuation frequency, which is something that we had predicted from our modeling or mathematical and computational modeling. Uh, but that prediction is about the real uh, insect organ, right? Well... I think that the, our model is so simplified compared to the complexity of the full insect respiratory system that um, it's probably a better model for the devices than it is the insect. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, along that line, I'm just curious, you know, how how good can the COMSO simulation uh, predicts? For example, if you put in the design of S1 to S10, mm -hmm. will your model predict what you observe in S1 to S10? Yeah, the the prediction between the modeling um, and the and the and the physical microfluidic devices is 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 good. Yeah, that reliability is good. I don't have a slide that that compares them here, but but that's reliable. So in the future, maybe you can do a lot of the design in silico, you know, and and then only test maybe a few like uh, yeah designs. Yeah, absolutely. We've actually done a data-driven approach, which, you know, everything I'm mentioning here, I'm like, oh, I should have had a slide on that. But we've done a data-driven approach where we, uh, you know, we've fabricated at this point hundreds, if not thousands of different device designs. And so we have things like, you know, flow channel length, taper angle, et cetera, and we have the flow rates. And so um, we've done a data-driven approach. Um, Rigong here has helped with that and, and Shuyu as well, um, where we try to predict what um, flow rate or what geometry will result in one flow rate. And that's been fairly successful in guiding our design.